Okay, let me share this wild experience I had in the Amazon jungle. I'm Roger, a biologist with an insatiable curiosity for uncovering the unknown. The Amazon, let me tell you, it's a gold mine for explorers like me. Here I found myself immersed in the depths of the Amazon rainforest, engaged in a field research endeavor generously supported by a prominent university. My journey commenced from the bustling hub of Manaus, Brazil, approximately a week earlier. The environment enveloped me in its vibrant greenery and pulsating vitality, transporting me to a realm unlike any other. While my primary focus was on studying the intricacies of the local ecosystem, fate had other plans in store, leading me to an astonishing discovery beyond my wildest imagination. The beginning of my journey revolved around encountering a tribe that remains relatively obscure, residing in considerable isolation, and maintaining minimal interaction with the outside world. Despite their guarded nature, I succeeded in earning their trust, allowing me to integrate into their community. While initially cautious, their demeanor softened as they recognized my benign intentions, fostering a semblance of friendship and acceptance. One evening, as we gathered around the flickering flames, I endeavored to grasp fragments of their language while the chief embarked upon narrating a tale. Though my comprehension was rudimentary and the chief occasionally interspersed Portuguese, it was unmistakable that this was no ordinary narrative. His speech carried a blend of reverence and apprehension, captivating the undivided attention of the assembled listeners, their hushed silence signaling the gravity of the moment. Once the story ended, I went to one of the younger tribe members who knew a bit of Portuguese. He seemed unsure and checked around before speaking. He explained it was a legend about a huge spider-like creature that lived in the forest long ago. They believed it was not only huge, but also very important to them in a special way. I was curious about the story, but I thought it might just be a made-up tale, like a story passed down through generations in the tribe. But then, something unexpected happened. The next day, the chief, who had become friendlier towards me, signaled for me to come with him. We walked further into the forest, away from the village, until we reached a clearing. And there, partially covered by plants and dirt, was something that shocked me to the core. I stood there, looking at it, trying to understand what it was. The chief looked at me, but I couldn't tell what he was thinking. I had a lot of questions, but I didn't know where to begin. Was this thing real? How did nobody notice it before? What did it mean to the tribe? Once I got over the surprise, I got really curious as a scientist. I started looking closely at the skeleton even though I didn't have any special tools. But what I saw didn't look like any spider I knew from science. I mean, it was really big to begin with. The chief kept an eye on me while I looked at the skeleton. I tried talking to him, but we couldn't understand each other well because of the different languages. From what I could tell by his gestures and a few words, the creature was really old and respected by the tribe, but there was also fear associated with it. It seemed like they saw it as a guardian of the forest, something that kept them safe, but at the same time, it could be dangerous if it felt threatened. After some time, the chief said it was time to go. I walked back with him to the village, my mind buzzing with questions and ideas. That night, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about the skeleton and what it might mean for science and how it could change what we know about the different plants and animals in the world. The next day I tried to talk about the skeleton with the tribe again, but they didn't seem comfortable with it. It was really important and special to them, something from their past they didn't want to talk about with someone from outside the tribe. I understood and respected their feelings, but it was still frustrating. I had found something amazing but I couldn't learn more about it. For the next few days, I tried talking to the tribe about their past, their stories, anything that could help me understand the creature, but it didn't work out. They were happy to chat about other stuff, but whenever I mentioned the skeleton, they didn't want to talk, so I had to make a choice. Should I keep asking even if it upsets the tribe and might be risky for me? Or should I drop it, respecting their feelings but possibly missing out on a really important discovery? I was really unsure about what to do. On one hand, I felt like I should gather as much information as possible for science, but on the other hand, I wanted to honor the tribe's feelings and their way of life. 
Finding something like that doesn't happen often and neither does being accepted into a community like theirs. In the end, I decided to step back, at least for now. I thought maybe I could learn more about the creature from stories of other tribes or places. A few days later I was gathering plant samples when I found something really strange. It was a circular clearing in the forest with no trees, just bare earth in a perfect circle. It felt weird, like something spooky. And in the middle of it all, there was a stone altar with carvings that looked like spiders. I'm not really superstitious, but this place gave me the creeps. It felt like I had stumbled into somewhere I shouldn't be. I quickly took some photos and got out of there. When I got back to the village that night, I showed the photos to the young guy who spoke Portuguese. He reacted strongly. He seemed really upset, talking quickly, and I heard him say the word forbidden. He made me promise not to go back there, saying it was a special place and risky. He didn't explain why, just kept saying it was forbidden. The next few days were uncomfortable. I could tell things had changed in the village. People were quieter around me, and there was a strange feeling in the air. I couldn't help feeling like I had caused some trouble. One night I woke up to a lot of noise outside my tent. The whole village was there, staring up at the trees, and when I went out I saw it too. In the moonlight, there was this huge web in the treetops. It was massive, covering a big part of the trees. And in the middle of the web there was something too big and strange to be a regular spider. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Was this the legendary creature? But it was supposed to be gone, wasn't it? The tribe was frantic, some praying, others yelling. The chief looked serious and focused. Then he saw me and approached. In simple Portuguese, he told me the creature was real. It was a protector of the forest, but it was upset because I went to the sacred place. He said the tribe needed to do a ritual to calm it down so it wouldn't come to the village. I was shocked, and it felt like something from a movie, not real life, but there it was, right in front of me. The tribe started the ritual, chanting and giving gifts to the creature. It was intense, almost like I was in a trance. I couldn't stop looking at the web and the thing in the middle. Then, as the ritual got more intense, the thing moved. It was like a big scary shadow coming out of the darkness. But it didn't come down. It stayed in the web like it was watching us, and after the ritual the creature went back into the forest. The danger feeling went away but everyone was still scared and amazed. The next morning I packed up and said goodbye to everyone. The tribe was nice, but they didn't want me around anymore. As I left the village, I couldn't stop thinking about the forest, wondering what else they knew that I didn't, and that's the whole story. I'm back in the city now, but I can't stop thinking about that forest, the giant spider, and the tribe. It's a story I'll never forget, a reminder of how strange and mysterious our world can be. My grandparents moved to a place called Southern Florida, near Fort Lauderdale a long time ago, back in the early 2000s. And like always, we used to spend almost every holiday with them, and when I was little it was easy to travel there, but when I started going to college in Nashville, it became a bit harder. The journey to their place was quite simple, just down I-75. But when you reach the southern end in Florida, the road goes straight through a big area of wild land called Big Cypress Preserve in the Everglades. Even as a kid I found it odd to have a highway there, but it sure is pretty. Sometimes you can even spot alligators basking in the sun along the road. When we were younger and drove down with our parents, my older brother used to tease me about monsters living in the swamp. By the time we arrived at our grandparents' house, I'd be terrified, even though Fort Lauderdale isn't known for having scary creatures, except for some huge cockroaches, it never calmed my nerves. So during college in 2018, I was heading down for Thanksgiving. I remember it clearly because it was the year before a big storm named Nicole hit, and I couldn't make it for the next couple of years. I was trying to reach there fast, pushing harder than usual because I stayed in Nashville longer than planned. By the time I crossed into the National Preserve, I was over 12 hours into the drive, and I was getting tired. If I pushed more, I could reach by midnight, which my mom was expecting.
It was late and it felt like I'd been driving in the dark forever. No amount of snacks or caffeine could keep me alert, especially in the preserves. Everything felt strange in the dark. The nights there could get very humid, and thick fog could appear suddenly, making driving dangerous. So I was frustrated because I just wanted to speed up and finish the last bit of the journey, but instead, I had to deal with foggy cypresses. Maybe I was going faster than I should have, but I thought I could see other vehicles in time to avoid anything big on the road, and then suddenly, something jumped out of the fog less than 50 feet ahead, and I hit the brakes hard. The car swerved, and I struggled to keep control. I was going to hit whatever was in the road, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Instinctively, I steered to hit it on the front passenger side so it wouldn't crash into the windshield. We collided, and the thing let out a loud cry before falling into the gully. My heart raced as I made contact. In my panic, I hadn't seen it clearly, but I could tell it was standing upright. So, I pulled over, scared that I'd find a person lying in the swamp. With the passenger side headlight broken, that side of the road was dark. I remembered my dad's advice to keep a flashlight in the glove box, so I got it out and went to look. The first thing I noticed was the smell, not exactly like something dead, but a mix of bad body odor and animal scent. I had to cover my nose with my shirt to get closer and my heart pounded as it seemed to have a human shape, but the more I looked, the less it looked human. Its proportions were odd, with arms seeming too long, and it was covered in reddish hair, like an orangutan, but too tall. The smell, the weird shape, and all the stories my brother told came back to me. It sounded crazy, but I was sure it was a skunk ape. My hands shook as I climbed back into the car to call my dad. I was too rattled to drive, but then I heard strange wails from the fog. Not just one, but many. I didn't know where they were coming from, but I knew I had to leave. Against my better judgment, I turned on my high beams to compensate for the broken headlight and drove off as fast as I could. Somehow I reached my parents' place, but I don't remember much of the drive. When I got there, my dad was waiting for me and everything spilled out. I was shaking and crying so hard that I woke everyone up. At first, my dad thought I made it up to avoid getting in trouble for wrecking the car, but when he saw me, he knew it was real. And now, we're all affected. I live in Massachusetts, and one day while walking around town, I stumbled upon an old abandoned factory downtown. There were absolutely no markings or signs or anything to give you an idea of what the factory was used for. I love old historic buildings, so naturally curiosity got the best of me. The bricks must have been laid hundreds of years ago, and it looked like it still had the original glass. It was incredible, so one day I decided to grab my camera and check out what the inside looked like. I was planning on making a whole day of it. I packed a lunch and figured I would be able to get some awesome pictures of the inside and outside of it. It would be my own little way of preserving some history. When I arrived and was pumping myself up to climb the fence, the gate opened automatically, and a van drove through and disappeared behind the building. I now thought that hopping the fence and taking pictures might be considered trespassing at a business, so I abandoned my original plan and got the heck out of there. I started asking friends and family if they knew what business was going on at that building and nobody had any idea and assumed it had been abandoned a long time ago. This didn't sit well with me, and I just became more and more curious about it as time went on. I began researching the building, and to my absolute amazement, there is no record of it at all online. And horrifyingly, if you look it up on Google Maps, the entire building and surrounding area is blurred out. It was at this point that my curiosity turned into a full-blown obsession. I was determined to find out what was going on in that building. I started packing lunches and staking out in my car with binoculars to try to gather all the information I could about this place. On the first day, I sat there and saw the gates open up, so I looked through my binoculars and, sure enough, I saw another van with blacked-out windows pull in there. One detail stuck out to me that scared me. The license plate was one of those farm-use ones. Now, I'm not a farmer by any means, but it was obvious to me that that was not the type of van that the typical farmer would use. Did that van just slap a farm-use license plate on the back to conceal their identity? 
The longer I sat there, the more identical vans I saw go in there, all with farm use license plates. Something was fishy. Something was seriously off, but I had no idea what was going on in the building. One day, I noticed something else that was strange. A van pulled up to the entrance of the factory, and a man got out wearing a lab coat. He was holding a cage with what appeared to be a small animal inside. My heart sank as I watched him enter the building, and I knew that something terrible was going on inside. After witnessing this, I knew that I had to gather more information. I started researching animal testing and government operations, trying to find any information that could help me understand what was going on in that factory. I knew that this was dangerous, but I couldn't ignore what I had seen. Finally, after weeks of gathering information and building up the courage, I decided to break into the factory and see for myself what was going on. I waited until the middle of the night when I knew that there would be no one around, wore all black and a mask, and I climbed over the fence and entered the building through a broken window. What I saw inside the factory will haunt me forever. There were animals everywhere, all of them trapped in cages and clearly in distress. They were all being subjected to various horrific tests, and I could hear their cries of pain echoing through the building. It was like something out of a nightmare. I haven't been able to sleep, and the sounds of their cries continuously haunt me to the point where I can't think about anything else. I don't know what to do. I feel like I can't go to the police because I broke into the building illegally, and I can't risk being thrown in jail. I have a family to support for heaven's sake, but I also can't pretend I didn't see what I saw. I don't know where to turn. I have been struggling with this for weeks now, trying to figure out what to do. I know that I can't just sit back and do nothing, but I also don't want to put myself or my family in danger by going public with this information. I am torn between my desire to help these innocent animals and my fear of the consequences of getting involved. Every night I find myself tossing and turning in bed, unable to sleep. When I do manage to drift off, my dreams are plagued with vivid images of the animals I saw in that factory, their faces twisted in pain and terror. The sounds of their cries echo in my mind, haunting me even in my sleep. I wake up in a cold sweat, gasping for air, unable to shake the images from my mind. It's as if they are calling out to me, pleading with me to do something to stop the cruelty that is happening to them. I feel a deep sense of guilt that I am unable to help them, and it eats away at me each night. During the day, my stomach is in knots, and I have a constant pit in my gut. I can't bring myself to eat, knowing that I have witnessed the atrocities being committed against those innocent creatures. How can humanity be capable of such cruelty and disregard for life? It's not just the animals that suffer, but the people, too. How can they go home to their families, knowing what they have done to those poor creatures? I feel sick to my stomach, and the very thought of food makes me feel nauseous. It's as if my body is rejecting anything that comes from a world that allows such heinous acts to occur. I feel powerless knowing that there are people out there who are capable of such inhumane actions and wondering if anything I do will make a difference. After many months of careful planning and getting everything ready, I finally set off on my big journey to the wonderful country of South Africa. I was super excited to see all the amazing animals there. I had heard about the many cool creatures that live there, but I never thought I'd see something as incredible as what I saw. When I got there, I saw something that was truly amazing. It was a gigantic creature that glowed with a bright green light. It stood really tall, about seven feet, and it looked kind of like a fish, but not like any fish I'd ever seen before. The green light it gave off lit up the water all around it, and it was such a breathtaking sight that I couldn't believe my eyes. My heart raced with excitement, and I couldn't stop staring at this incredible creature. I had never seen anything like it before, and it was such a special experience. South Africa is an awesome place, and I think everyone should try to visit if they can, but you have to be careful and stay safe. One day, while I was taking a walk by the Mzintlava River, I spotted something strange in the water, and it looked like a huge fish, but it was glowing bright green, and it must have been at least seven feet tall. I was so amazed by what I saw. 
As I looked at the creature's glowing green light, I couldn't believe how intense it was. It lit up everything around it, making the river and the forest look magical. It felt like the whole place was under a spell from this strange creature. I felt both amazed and a little scared at the same time, but it was like nothing I'd ever seen before, and I wondered how something so fascinating could also be a bit scary. It was a sight that I'll never forget, like a really vivid dream. When I was coming back from my adventures in South Africa, I met a fascinating woman at a bar. She was really beautiful, and we hit it off right away. I told her all about the amazing things I'd seen, and she was just as excited as I was, so we ended up talking all night and having some really fun adventures together. As we lay in bed later, sipping on some wine and sharing stories, she told me about a creature called the Mamlambo. It was said to be really scary and lived in the Mzintlava River. Its glow could light up the whole river and the forest around it. As she talked, I felt a shiver go down my back and I realized that we had both seen the same creature. Her words stayed with me long after that night, and I couldn't stop thinking about them. It was like the memory of the Mamlambo was stuck in my head, and it made me see things differently. When I got back home, I couldn't stop thinking about the Mamlambo. I wanted to learn everything I could about it, so I started doing some research. I looked up old stories, talked to people who had seen it, and spent a lot of time searching online. I just had to know more about this mysterious creature. Every day I got more and more obsessed with finding out everything I could about the Mamlambo. The more I learned, the more fascinated I became, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. From what I found out, the Mamlambo, also known as the Brain Sucker, was a really scary creature that used to scare people in villages around South Africa. It was known for its scary way of killing its victims. It would pull them into the river, where they would drown, and then it would open their skulls to suck out their brains and blood. It was a really scary thought, and it gave me chills just thinking about it, but learning about the Mamlambo also made me feel glad that I had survived my trip to South Africa without running into it. Looking back on my encounter with the Mamlambo, I realize how much it changed my life. It taught me to be more careful when I'm exploring new places, but it also showed me how amazing and sometimes scary the world can be. And that woman I met at the bar, she was like a ray of sunshine in my life, and she inspired me to learn more about the Mamlambo, and through that, I learned a lot about myself too. I learned to appreciate new experiences and to never stop exploring and learning new things. So even though my encounter with the Mamlambo was pretty scary, it also helped me grow and learn in ways I never expected. Every time I think about it, I still feel scared and it was a very scary experience. I'm not sure what kind of creature I saw, but it was late summer, and me and my partner decided to drive to my family's cabin for the weekend. We took separate cars because my partner got off work late, so I got to the cabin around 3 in the afternoon and looked around. There were other cabins nearby, but nobody seemed to be home. I thought it was good because we wouldn't have to worry about noise from other people. The neighbors across from us often had parties, so I was glad they weren't there. After I settled in, I started a fire in the fire pit and decided to read. After an hour, I put out the fire and went inside to clean up before my partner arrived. I had a lot of cleaning to do. After a while, I started making dinner, but I realized I left some things in my car, so I went outside to get them. The sun was starting to disappear behind the clouds. When I went outside, I saw that the fire pit was still on, but I thought I had turned it off earlier. I wondered why it was on again but then I thought I must have forgotten to turn it off completely, and after I got what I needed from my car, I heard music. I looked over and saw that the noisy neighbors had arrived. I laughed to myself, thinking they would be loud all night, but I felt relieved because my partner hadn't arrived yet, and I wasn't alone. Later, my partner texted to say they were coming soon, so I went outside to turn on the fire pit again. As I sat in my chair... I saw someone standing at the neighbor's cabin, so I squinted to see who it was. It looked like a man, so I waved to him. He waved back, but it was too dark to see clearly. I thought it was too late to meet him then, but I would say hello tomorrow. My partner arrived, and we went to bed. I woke up around midnight to get some water, and from the window, I saw the neighbors in the hot tub with music playing. 
I thought they wouldn't be up early enough for me to say hello in the morning. We didn't know them very well, but we always greeted each other when we were at the cabin. The next morning, my partner and I went exploring, and when we got back to the cabin, I remembered I wanted to say hello to the neighbors. I knocked on their door, but nobody answered. I saw their cars, so I knew they were there. Maybe they were still sleeping or out hiking, so I decided to go back later. As I turned to leave, I saw footprints on the ground near my fire pit. I remembered seeing someone standing there the night before, so I looked closer at the footprints. They looked like human footprints, but bigger, and I started to worry that they might belong to a bear. I knocked on the neighbor's door again, but still no answer. The door was open a little, so I peeked inside. I thought about asking my partner to come with me, but I went in alone. The house was quiet, so I looked in three rooms and didn't see anyone. Then I went to the fourth room. It smelled strange, and the room was a mess. The bed was torn apart, and there was red stuff on the floor. I started to clean up, but then I saw animal bones. I was scared and couldn't move. Then I heard something downstairs, like something running. I was too scared to move. A big furry animal came into the room, and it sniffed around and ate the bones. Then it ran away. I was still scared and shocked. When I got back to our cabin, I didn't say anything at first. Later, I told my partner what happened, but we decided not to tell the neighbors. Later that night, we heard the neighbors crying. They had left their dog behind, and I felt sad because I saw the dog's remains. I wanted to tell them what happened, but I was too scared.